Hello, everybody. This is Dipendra Manocha and uh, from, from India, from DAISY Consortium. Welcome, everybody. We are here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of an extremely important event uh, that happened 10 years ago, which is that we agreed on the Marrakesh Treaty text. It was huge celebration. It was such a big relief. It was, and why I think we are we are uh, here to see after ten years the impact has been absolutely wonderful, absolutely revolutionary. <laughs> Just to um, uh, give a short glimpse or short uh, thing, what what it really has meant. Um, I remember, uh, you know, my own journey starting from you know uh, I call it five to five million books journey of my lifetime. When I was a student myself, as a person with blindness, uh, we I had access to, my whole class actually had access to just five books and single copy of those five, five books in accessible format. Uh, as I went to university, I actually did not have even one book that I could read myself, which meant that I was dependent on others for reading all through. And the experience was so frustrating that uh, I actually left my PhD in between and switched over to the field where I am today, which is to fight for, uh, you know, ending the book famine for persons with blindness and low vision in the developing countries. It started with India, but obviously, uh, thankfully, uh, for DAISY Consortium's platform that uh, we are now able to work in several developing countries uh, doing this, uh, addressing this whole challenge. Um, we had, uh, I remember a lot of us got together, the whole treaty is about getting all stakeholders together. Uh, I remember the stakeholders platform, I remember the whole negotiations that were going on before the treaty was signed, and um, how uh, everybody got onto the same table and, and, and everybody had that intention very clear. But uh, obviously, there were a lot of doubts, a lot of things that had to, to be cleared up before we came up with the final Marrakesh Treaty. Um, I told about the problems that we were facing, but uh, in India, in Daisy Forum of India, we actually got together. We uh, identified that our copyright law requires changes to allow us uh, with the exceptions. We got that amendment in 2012, which is one year before the actual treaty text got uh, finalized. And uh, uh, because of that, uh, India, uh, you know, Indian government was already on board when the negotiations were going on. They became big supporter from the government side. And uh, as soon as the treaty was actually finalized, because most of the provisions were already there in our copyright law. We were already compliant, so to say. India became the first country to ratify the Marrakesh Treaty uh, in the world. So, um, as I said, today, because of this, that Marrakesh Treaty, because of the ABC Global Book Service, because of the book shares, and all that uh, that is getting enabled because of the Marrakesh Treaty, I today in India has have access to more than 5 million books that I can just pick any one of them, either buy or get it through our library. And because of all that, I'm able to, uh, you know, you know, access such wide variety of uh, content in a country like India. That's been the impact of this Marrakesh Treaty. And uh, we are here um, to celebrate, to get together and to see that um, that you know um, that that uh, what a, you know like all it's it's almost like all those people who had all those organizations who had dreamt about this or worked towards this treaty we are coming together again just to have recollect all our memories and also to see where the where we are headed uh, for future so uh, let me uh, start with bringing in and requesting um, a representative from the Accessible Books Consortium, WIPO, which is administering this, this treaty. 
Monica Halil is right here with us. Uh, Monica, would you like to please come and uh, mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dipendra, and thank you for those inspirational words and showing us at a personal level how uh, the treaty has uh, impacted you and made it possible for you to get access to reading material. So uh, to those of you, um, hello, <laughs> I'm Monica Halil Loveplad. I'm head of the Accessible Books Consortium, uh, which is a public-private partnership. Um, I am a World Intellectual Property Organization staff member, and I sit in Geneva, Switzerland. My first uh, screen is actually the diplomatic conference in Morocco, in Marrakesh, and you see a room full of delegates. This is actually June 27th, uh, 2013, when the de delegates actually adopted the Marrakesh Treaty in Morocco. So really, I think uh, I wasn't, present in Marrakesh, but I'm told that by those who were, it was a real feeling of celebration and of um, accomplishment on that day, and it was called the Miracle of Marrakesh. So what is the Marrakesh Treaty? Of course, all of you know, uh, it's a landmark historical humanitarian treaty. Uh, the treaty is administered by the World Intellectual Property Organization, Member states deposit instruments of ratification or accession with WIPO's Director General. Currently, there are 93 contracting parties covering uh, 119 countries because, of course, the European Union uh, ratified as one block. So, um, the Accessible Books Consortium is a public private partnership, as I had stated earlier. Uh, and it comprises all of the main uh, stakeholders. Uh, for uh, the production and distribution of accessible books. And we seek basically to try and um, distribute books to uh, beneficiaries around the world. And so we're very, really implementing the Marrakesh Treaty at a practical level. And just by way of sort of uh, uh, showing how far we've come, uh, Dependra mentioned going from five books to five million. Uh, we started in January 2014 with 11 authorized entities because there had been quite a bit of preparatory work done in anticipation of Marrakesh uh, being adopted. So we did start with uh, 11 authorized entities when we launched in 2014. Um, and currently in June 2023, we have 127 authorized entities. So we really come a long way, perhaps not as dramatic as Dependra's five to five million, but still uh, we think we've uh, really progressed enormously. Of the 127 authorized entities uh, that are members of the ABC Global Book Service, 70 are from developing or least developed countries. And 840,000 titles are now available for cross-border exchange under the framework of the Marrakesh Treaty. In January 2014, we had 225,000 titles available in the catalog. So again, uh, we've, uh, I'd say, a quadrupled or nearly quadrupled our catalog. And of course, in 2014, these titles were not available for cross-border exchange because the treaty had not yet come into force. The 840,000 titles of which I'm speaking are all available for cross-border exchange without the need to request permissions from rights holders. So the ABC Global Book Service, of those 840,000 titles, we have 80 languages, more than 80 languages actually. And just to give you an idea, uh, we have over 280,000 titles in English, 110,000 titles in French, and 51,000 titles in Spanish. Uh, in terms of impact, in 2022 alone, uh, more than 140,000 titles were delivered to beneficiaries through the library and supplementary applications of ABC. So through our uh, authorized entities, through the 127 members, we are delivering titles to people who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. So, one of the things, again, in sort of looking back in our 10 years, it's always time to take stop, take stock, sorry, to, to look at where we've um, come from and what we've done. What we were trying to get a sense of is, you know, what makes a difference in terms of whether there's uh, usage 
by and authorized entities, whether they're downloading, searching for titles in the ABC Global Book Service, whether beneficiaries are downloading the titles. What is it that makes a difference? And we basically came down with two main things. One is it really matters. <laughs> the the Marrakesh Treaty has huge impact. You To be able to take advantage of the ABC Global Book Service, the authorized entity must be located in a country that has both ratified and implemented a treaty. This seems a bit trite for me to say this, but there are a number of countries around the world that have ratified but have not implemented, which means that beneficiaries cannot take advantage of this catalog. So this is still a challenge. Uh, there's a large number of ratifications. Unfortunately, there are not a similar number of, of uh, countries where the treaty has been implemented into national law. So that's one really important factor. And the second key factor that we have uh, sort of uh, assessed and noticed as being critical for whether or not uh, authorized entities and beneficiaries are able to benefit from our catalog is whether or not we have digital files available for download. So we started off our catalog by just uh, ingesting metadata and the digital file or audio file was um, only uh, uh, upon request. We are now trying to proactively upload digital files so that they're available for immediate download. And I think this makes an enormous difference in uh, sort of practicality and usage of the service. So I just have a graph up on my screen now, just to give you an idea um, of our 127 authorized entities, 80 are located in countries that have implemented uh, the Marrakesh Treaty. And we see this was sort of gradu a gradual uh, or not so gradual increase actually. So in 2016, there were only three countries that had uh, implemented the Marrakesh Treaty. In 2019, it was 25 countries, uh, sorry, 25 authorized entities located in countries that have implemented the treaty. And in 2023, we have 80 authorized entities located in countries that have both ratified and implemented the Marrakesh Treaty. So we're seeing sort of um, the progression in leaps and bounds there. In terms of number of digital files available for download, again, we see the graph going up in leaps and bounds. So we see that in 20, in just by way of example, 2020, we had about, uh, I think it was about uh, 60 or 55,000 digital files available in the catalog, uh, available for immediate download. And in 2023, we have 380,000 uh, titles available for immediate download, just to give you an idea of, of the expansion. And I think this is a really, again, critical factor in terms of uh, usage for our authorized entities. So we saw sort of trends. Um, when the treaty came into force in October 2016, we saw an increase in the number of downloads. So usage in, went up in the following year. So comes into force in October, increase goes up in 2017. Again, increase in, in usage of the ABC Global Book Service um, in 2019 due to the implementation of the Marrakesh Treaty in the European Union in October 2018 and in the United States in February 2019. Again, we're seeing a direct correlation between the two, cause and effect. Again, downturn in 2020, 21 due to COVID. Surprisingly, we thought we would get an increase, but a lot of libraries authorized entities shut down. So we did see a dip. And then an upturn in 2022, which we think was due again to the increase uh, in the number of digital files, we made a concerted effort to really increase as I showed you previously on the graph. If you have any questions, we'd be happy, happy to answer them. You can contact us at accessible.books at wipo.int and you can look at our website at accessiblebooksconsortium.org. And I'll just stop there. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Monica. This is bringing out, uh, you know, uh, so much of effort and so much of uh, faith and belief and a lot of efforts of people who have gone together to achieve what where we are today in within 10 years. 10 years may seem long to some, but when it comes to treaty and its uh, ratification all around the world and the full participation and implementation also, 
I think it's it's been really been a uh, very, very quick uh, turnaround. Um, also, uh, you know, when I say five, we, I have access to five million doesn't mean that the work is finished. I think it's uh, because um, I belong to those, um, you know, uh, privileged ones who have all the access and knowledge and tools to take benefit of what is become available because of Marrakesh Treaty, but very large population, especially in low and middle, uh, you know, low and middle income group countries are still struggling to even, even know about what has really happened. Um, so with that, I think I will, I'll, let's, let's come to um, uh, the World Blind Union and the CEO of World Blind Union, Mr. Mark Workman is right here with us. Uh, this is the organization which represents persons with blindness, low vision in, 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 in the world. It's, it's a representative organization and the organization that actually initiated the whole process, which really convinced WIPO that we must work on this treaty. Not just that, uh, they actually uh, uh, created a whole campaign, uh, you know, the right to read campaign and then once the the, the uh, treaty text was finalized, their whole effort on convincing governments all through the world to actually ratify the treaty and now on its implementation. So, so a huge work um, done, uh, very big achievement, I must say. Congratulations to World Blind Union on this. And with that, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Mark, uh, uh, Mark Workman to please take the stage. Thank you so much, Dipendra. Really uh, great to be here, dear friends and colleagues. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today at this momentous event to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the Marrakesh Treaty. This treaty, which is undoubtedly a landmark achievement, has been instrumental in promoting equal access to information for individuals who are blind or partially sighted. So as mentioned, my name is Mark Workman. I have the privilege of serving as the CEO of the World Blind Union. And as we commemorate this milestone, I'd like to highlight the role that uh, WBU played when it came to advocating for adoption of the Marrakesh Treaty, as well as ongoing efforts to ensure its full implementation. So the WBU has been at the forefront of this advocacy journey, right from the beginning through leaders like our former president, Marianne Diamond. We recognize the urgent need to address the barriers faced by blind and partially sighted individuals when it comes to accessing uh, published works, which um, due to lack of accessibility really impeded our ability to fully participate in society. And so with steady determination. We lobbied governments, international organizations to support the development of a treaty which was designed to remove those obstacles and promote equal opportunities for all. However, as, as noted, our advocacy efforts did not cease with the adoption of the Marrakesh Treaty, uh, recognizing that the successful implementation of the treaty is crucial. WBU has also been engaged in promoting uh, full enactment of the treaty worldwide. We know that ratification alone is not enough. True impact will lie in tangible actions and uh, useful resources and tools. And so in line with this goal, WBU has also produced comprehensive resources like the Guide to the Marrakesh Treaty, which assists governments, organizations, individuals in understanding and, and implementing the treaty's provisions effectively. So despite the progress made over the past decade, um, we can't ignore the fact that many governments, as Monica recently noted, have ratified the treaty, but have not fully implemented its provisions. And, and this gap between ratification and implementation is a, is a concern for us because it prevents those who are blind or partially sighted from exercising their fundamental right to access information. So I think we want to redouble our efforts and work collaboratively to bridge this implementation gap so that we can ensure that the Marrakesh Treaty's transformative 
potential becomes a reality for all. And as I was sort of reflecting on the journey um, in preparation for this meeting, uh, filled with a lot of gratitude, um, but also some, some sorrow for recent events, last year we tragically lost one of our most passionate advocates in this uh, area, and that's, of course, Scott Labar. Scott had um, an incredible energy and enthusiasm for this work, and it was really instrumental in advancing the, the treaty. And I think his legacy serves as a reminder for the urgent work that still lies ahead of us, and we can honor his memory by continuing to champion the rights of those who are blind or partially sighted and advocating for the full uh, implementation of the treaty. So looking ahead, the World Blind Union remains um, committed to push all countries across the world to ratify and fully implement the Marrakesh Treaty. Our vision is one where everyone, uh, whether you're blind or partially sighted or not, can fully realize your right to access information, empowering them to participate fully in education, employment, cultural life, and so to achieve this vision, we will collaborate with partners like WIPO, uh, the DAISY Consortium, and of course, the International Federation of Library Associations, as well as governments, civil society, and stakeholders at all level with the goal of removing barriers and creating an inclusive society for all. So in conclusion, as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of this landmark treaty, Let's acknowledge the significant role of organizations of persons with disabilities like the World Blind Union and individuals like, of course, Marianne Diamond and Scott Labar, uh, who advocated so passionately for the adoption of the treaty. We're committed to promoting full implementation, implementation of the treaty, and we extend an invitation to all stakeholders to join us on this transformative journey. I think that together we can create a world where information doesn't isn't constrained by borders and the right to access knowledge becomes a reality for all people regardless of print disability. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm really excited about this event and looking forward to listening to the remaining speakers. Back over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. I mean, so, so rightly said. Uh, and uh, the advocacy has of course uh, played a huge role in getting the uh, laws in place both for international and uh, national level uh, system the, the the things have been put in place um the both the accessible books consortium the wipo um and wbu doesn't believe that uh, you know just the advocacy is enough the for implementation simultaneously and parallelly things are being done so that the actual implementation happens uh, you know the impact reaches in the hands of users um, while um, while abc has also um, you know hosted the uh, book exchange mechanism for 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 the actual practical implementation um, i am reminded that we uh, you know um, we're going to uh, countries in africa where uh, people are still not aware that uh, you know such mechanism already exists and they have access to thousands of books that they can actually get access to so uh, so i think there is obviously a lot to be done in terms of implementation and one of the organizations which is taking lead uh, in this level of implementation and which has been partnering with the world blind union right from day one and uh, also with WIPO has been DAISY Consortium. So moving from CEO of World Blind Union, I'm very happy to welcome CEO of DAISY Consortium here, um, Richard Ohm, who's here to share with us what has this treaty meant for DAISY Consortium and uh, what role are we playing in the implementation? Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Dipendra. I'm honored to represent the DAISY Consortium, the membership and the staff team in this wonderful 10th birthday celebration. It's a pleasure to be with so many respected organizations and individuals who are driving change and removing barriers. So if you don't know us, the DAISY Consortium is the non-profit global authority on publishing and reading for people with blindness, low vision, and other print disabilities. Our vision is that people have access, equal access to information and knowledge regardless of disability, 
a right, of course, confirmed by the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Our team of international experts develop standards, tools, and best practices that are embraced by leading technology companies, publishers, and library services. And using the technologies developed by DAISY, our members and friends have produced millions of books, journals, newspapers, and other documents that can be read by people with disabilities in the way that works for them. So whether someone needs to read through enlarged text, through audio or braille, on whatever continent and in whatever language, there are technologies and standards developed by the DAISY Consortium that can make that information accessible to everyone, irrespective of disability. So DAISY Consortium members and friends have made education and reading accessible to millions of people with disabilities. And way back in 2004, Microsoft, together with DAISY, hosted the Global Summit in Redmond in the USA for more than 75 accessible libraries where the dream of a global collection was born. Well, it's taken nearly 20 years, but we're well down that path. And the miracle of Marrakesh is a huge part of that. Thanks to the treaty itself, and very importantly, the continued diligent efforts of dedicated organizations and individuals, many of whom are represented on this webinar, more accessible books are available to more people with print disabilities than ever. The free tools from the DAISY Consortium are helping organizations and publishers to create locally relevant accessible publications, and our technical training helps organizations and publishers ensure that they're using the current standards and best practices to ensure that the accessible books they make can be usefully shared for the benefit of print disabled people in other countries. Common technical standards are a fundamental requirement for the effective international exchange mechanism. And so for accessible books, the DAISY Consortium is proud to have led the way in developing these standards and work together with our friends to develop software tools for the production, conversion, and reading of accessible books. Last year, DAISY delivered technical training and capacity building support in 100 countries. The work of our partners is bringing greater access to education, enhanced social integration and cultural participation. The removal of barriers to published materials has the power to transform the lives of millions of people with disabilities to create an inclusive educational environment. Let's just take the example of one such person and our moderator, Dipendra, leads Daisy's work in developing countries. And he recently shared the story of Naveen, a 13 year old boy in school in rural India. Now, despite the sustainable development goal number four being an inclusive and quality education for all, Naveen, who is blind, had never himself read a book. And the same was true of others in his class with print disabilities. Because there are no accessible books in his school, Naveen had always relied on someone else reading aloud to him. But thanks to a DAISY Consortium project, the blind learners in Naveen's school now can read their school books using a simple solar powered audio player. This is an example of how books produced to common standards can be used by a wide range of reading solutions, in this case, converted for use with the basic devices that may be found in very low resource areas. I'm sure that many more stories will be told by other panelists of the impact of the treaty and how it's been such an important step towards access to information and knowledge. Earlier this month, I was visiting a small organization which works to support children's education in a rural region of East Africa. And here I met with Rebecca and Solomon, two young people with visual impairments who don't have access to any accessible books. Using the accessible book production tools from DAISY and the innovations from ourselves and our partner organizations, soon they could have access to more books than their sighted friends. But because their country has not yet implemented the Marrakesh Treaty, they still need to ask for permissions from rights holders 
and this has not been granted for their school books. And they also are unable to benefit from the treasure trove of accessible books that Monica spoke of and have already been made in other countries. There are too many countries that have been slow to adopt and implement the treaty. There are still too many people with print disabilities who are not able to share our joy as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the treaty. But there is cause for celebration nonetheless. The Marrakesh Treaty has led to disabled persons organizations, specialist library services, rights holders, international development organizations, all working together as never before. Together, we've supported organizations to create more accessible books and share these internationally for the benefit of people with print disabilities and freeing up resources by avoiding duplication. Accessible reading and education is not the privilege of high income countries. It's for everyone in our shared world. So today on the anniversary of the Marrakesh Treaty, the DAISY Consortium is launching a survey to map the availability of accessible reading in low and middle income countries where most of the people with print disabilities are living. This survey will help us understand the situation of people with print disabilities in relation to the books they need for school, university and general literature. And importantly, it will help us to map which languages are underserved by key enabling technologies, such as text-to-speech and Braille. And we intend to publish the interim results of this survey, which we're doing in partnership with sister organizations in the fourth quarter of this year. The Marrakesh Treaty is an important step towards ensuring that everyone has access to information and knowledge, regardless of their abilities, and it's a an powerful tool for promoting inclusion and diversity in our society. Marrakesh Treaty was a landmark agreement. It has the potential to change the lives of millions of people, it's a testament to the power of international cooperation and the importance of protecting the rights of all individuals. To all of us on our webinar and attending our webinar today, I say happy 10th birthday to all of us. Thank you so much, Richard. I think this was um, absolutely wonderful uh, <clears throat> thing because uh, you've you've really highlighted the all the effort that is that is going on in the implementation and uh, and and how these previous ten years have made such a huge difference in that effort. I can uh, actually remember going into capacity building uh, programs in in developing countries uh, before this the Marrakesh Treaty uh, implementation. And we would, you know, go there, try to get set up libraries, and there would not be any books that we could take with us, uh, and everything had to be started from scratch. Whereas now, when we go to a to a developing country with our capacity building programs, um, you know, we 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 enter into any place which doesn't have libraries, and we say that start a library, and you have access to more than a million books that you can start distributing to your to to people in that country. It's that bigger difference that has happened because of this library. Thank you so much. Uh, from there, uh, uh, let's let's uh, uh, move on to another important um, organization today. It's the host organization, the IFLA, the International Federation of Libraries Association, and its section on uh, libraries for uh, serving pers persons with print disabilities. But let me Welcome, uh, 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 Stephen Weiber, who's representing IFLA over here to share uh, IFLA's perspective uh, and the experiences uh, related to Marrakesh Treaty. Stephen, floor is yours. Perfect. So thank you so much for the floor. And I think I, I want to underline a, a point that Richard made just now that, of course, the, the treaty is, it, it's such a game changer. In, in, in this field. I think, I know it's always very easy and, and we can see work that goes on at the international level as, as being slow, as being far from the ground, but I think the significance of Marrakesh in demonstrating that this is an issue, and I think we feel it and we still feel it in many cases, the interests 
of, of library users in general, but in particular library users with print disabilities, people sympathize, but whether they see them as enough of an issue to act, that's been a challenge. Marrakesh shows, no, this is an issue. Marrakesh, crucially, it provides a stimulus and it's been great to see all the effort of WIPO or WIPO now moving in behind the treaty in order to persuade countries, no, this, this has to be part of your reform program. It's normal to do this. You can't just keep on putting it off. And then clearly the guidance and the practical tools that are there also make such a huge difference. At the same time, a treaty is a treaty. It depends so much on working at the national level to implement, as has been said a few times, on the sort of the practical infrastructure, the tools that Richard, that the DAISY Consortium is so crucial in providing, in providing the content we've talked a lot, talked about a lot, skills, the procedures to get things happening, and the broader awareness. So the treaty, it's a trigger, it starts a movement, it doesn't complete the movement. So I need to run through quite quickly um, some of the ideas, I think some of the data that, 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 that Monica's already talked about, about this movement, about this crucial step of how do we move from the treaty to national implementation, that first key step towards realizing the potential of Marrakesh. Um, and I think, I know it, as I said, this advocacy matters. Um, as we know, and as Monica has already said, the treaty in itself normally doesn't have a direct impact on the ground. We need to take, we need national, national implementation to happen for, for anything to really change. But crucially within this, we need to make sure that countries are taking the right decisions. We need to engage to provide the information to make sure that the implementation of Marrakesh lives up to the spirit of Marrakesh. Um, I'm going to go through a few graphs, which I will, of course, explain. Um, this first graph looks at the numbers of countries where Marrakesh has entered into force per year, both per year and cumulatively. And we can see it's a sharply rising line, especially in the first few years. And the director general of WIPO at the time, Francis Goey, was very proud of saying this is WIPO's fastest moving treaty, which I think coming from, from the side of the debate of, of the organizations that promoted is a bit of a no brainer. It's a treaty that clearly does provide rights. It clearly does allow for access. It enables the achievement of policy goals around inclusion, around convention on the rights of persons with disabilities that were otherwise being held back. Um, in particular, we see obviously the first 20 or so in 2016, that big jump in 2019 when it entered into force in the European Union, continued to move up slightly slower in recent years, but that's because there are fewer countries that haven't ratified or acceded to the treaty. However, and again, this is a point that's been made by Monica, at least according to our, our assessment and, and happy to sort of share ideas and, and seek views on this, only about half of the countries that have ratified or acceded to the treaty have actually amended their laws. There's another roughly 5% in the process of doing so, but we're still left with over 45% of countries that have signed on the line, that have deposited their instrument of accession or ratification, but still need to actually do something in country. That's a big advocacy task for people in those countries. As said before, clearly there's a difference between a good implementation and a bad implementation from our point of view. The Marrakesh Treaty allows for possibilities um, to, it allows for possibilities to restrict the scope of the possibilities granted to persons with print disabilities to authorized entities. For example, by obliging them to pay additional money. Now, fortunately, actually, not many people, not many countries actually do that. So looking first of all at the countries, all of the countries that have signed up, over 60% don't impose supplementary remuneration requirements. Barely 30 do. But actually, when we look at the countries that have thought, that have gone through that national implementation process, actually almost 82% of countries have not imposed a supplementary remuneration requirement. Less than 10% have. So there's positive examples there of really focusing on the best possible implementation. We can also look at the question of commercial availability checks. Um, clearly, there's a less obvious financial impact on authorised entities here, but clearly the time, the uncertainty, the administration, the bureaucracy required in making commercial availability checks given in particular that it is still a struggle to get effective, to get reliable, accurate information. This is potentially a major cost, a major barrier to effective implementation of the treaty. Once again, 
if we look at, if it, once again, if we look across the board, those who have actually implemented about, uh, who, who have actually implemented the treaty, again, over two thirds have chosen not to impose such restrictions. The treaty also provides the possibility to extend its effect to persons with other disabilities. And again, we see relatively similar figures. This, this, this is less, I think this is an opt-in rather than opt-out provision, but we still are seeing it being pretty common. Actually, more countries that have acted nationally have decided to extend the treaty to people with other persons with other disabilities than have decided not to do so. Um, as I said, clearly this does leave a lot to do, especially in those countries that have not yet acceded to or ratified to. So those, the maths right now, over 60 countries where there's still that requirement. But of course, also in the roughly 45% of countries that have acceded or ratified, but have still to actually make national reforms happen, provide that clear space here to authorised entities to persons with disabilities. Um, it's a standard process. This is the same process as applies elsewhere. We look to support this, but there are other great organisations, clearly the World Blind Union, I for others are really active in pushing for this to happen. So making sure that our communities understand what the current situation is, how decisions are made, to identify champions and allies, to build coalitions. Again, we support this, our colleagues support this. Building up the evidence base, drawing on what's going on, helping people to understand what are the relevant stakeholders, how can you engage them? As always, defining goals, evaluating success, learning from what we're doing, and of course, drawing on the work of national, regional, and global partners. So I think this is probably more about setting out the challenge. I know we've got a lot of there's some really excellent tools being promoted by people who have throughout those 10 years, who not only throughout those 10 years have been active, but were involved in actually making Marrakesh happen in the first place. And there's a huge thank you to them. For the work and, and I know as someone who, who started focusing on this post post 2013 we're living with this amazing achievement that you, you the amazing achievement that they've given us um, it's up to us those who've come subsequently to join them to support them and to continue support and trying to really make sure that we get through those legislative stages we give the best possible opportunities to our librarians to our authorized entities to our organizations to everyone to make the reality of the potential of Marrakesh. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. And you have highlighted so many aspects of this treaty, which are so unique and so so wonderful. Um, and especially, I mean, I was also reminded that, you know, uh, this is a treaty which is an excellent example of mainstreaming versus uh, special um, infrastructures because uh, while we all acknowledge that there is no um, substitute to universal design and inclusive publishing and making uh, books born accessible, uh, we all know that we do need um, also the fallback mechanism and which where uh, this is where uh, on one side this treaty actually acknowledges uh, the, the importance of inclusive publishing it also acknowledges that the exceptions are required to ensure the rights of uh, persons with uh, print disabilities. So it's it's a very, very fair balance, one of the very good examples of how these things are complementary and not you know, opposite to each other. Um, thank you so much for, for this uh, uh, wonderful address and bringing all these uh, things, highlighting all these things of the salient features of the treaty. And with that, with that, we also now would like to have another representative from IFLA who has actually been involved in this whole movement uh, for a very, very long time and also represents the, um, the, the university libraries section. And uh, with that, I would like to you know, uh, give floor to Victoria Owen. Uh, Victoria, over to you. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Dipendra. So I've been asked to talk about the guides that we're using for for the Marrakesh Treaty. So for the libraries, um, and uh, why? So the need for guides is that this is really new territory for librarians, and they needed to know. They wanted to know how to fulfill their roles uh, with regards to the Marrakesh Treaty. So how does it how does it get implemented on the ground? 
what steps did they take? How do we, how are we able to um, get the benefits to the users of the treaty? So what were the first steps? So one of the things that we did uh, through the through IFLA and LPD was we we decided to start um, develop a hands-on guide. And it's called Getting Started. We started it in uh, 2017 at the IFLA um, National Conference. And we had, we invited people from LPD, from the Library Serving the Print Disabled, and other people who are interested in accessibility and, um, and decided uh, what, what, what the guide would cover. We worked with reviewers and writers from across the spectrum to put it together. And then we took the draft to the LPD at their um, midterm meeting in Brussels in 2018 and got further feedback and adopted that guide. So that guide now is available on the IFLA website. Uh, it sets out the basics of the Marrakesh Treaty in plain language. So there are, uh, as we've heard from, from almost everybody uh, who's spoken ahead of me, so there are different levels of people who are engaged in it. So I think as you begin, as you begin to implement it, look at your national legislation, the guide getting started is a very helpful guide. It is basic. It sets it out, the terms of the of the Marrakesh Treaty in plain language. It talks about how libraries will go about having sharing mechanisms, how to keep records, what book services actually exist, how to make use of national and international book services that are that are already up and running. Um, there are different national ones. There's there's the ABC. There are other things, uh, other services and resources that people can learn from and make use of in their national uh, adoption of of the uh, and implementation of the treaty, and how to deal with digital locks. How you know just how to look at all of the provisions of the treaty and think about them in a na in a national implementation. So we worked with uh, a generic. Uh, implementation to the to the Marrakesh Treaty, and then a number of countries took that um, took that guide and customized it to their national legislation. So I know Canada did, um, the United States did, Finland did, Lithuania, uh, Brazil. So there are many of them that are on the on the uh, Spain, Spain was one of the original ones. So um, so there are many of them on the IFLA website if you wanted to look at them or even add a specific language to help the people in, the, in a country that's beginning to implement it. It is a, it is a first step in, for libraries in looking at it um, and, and beginning the implementation process. So the next guide that we're, I'm working on, so Canada implemented the Marrakesh Treaty in 2016. We have legislative language, we put it in place. We have a number of, of, of um, we have the, the commercial availability check. So one of the, the limitations, one of the uh, optional provisions in the treaty Canada adopted. So we have uh, commercial availability checks. So the guide we had in a, our National Library Association had librarians who were on the ground practicing, wondering how to implement the commercial availability check. So what does that mean for them on the ground? So the Canadian Federation of Library Associations is developing a guide that answers that question, what is a reasonable search? Because our legislation said um, you can, you do a commercial availability check and it's it used reasonable three times in the language. So within a reasonable time for a reasonable price with reasonable efforts. So we wanted to know what constitutes a reasonable search. So we proposed, so we worked with library serving uh, people with print disabilities across Canada um, and we also expanded it to have a coalition of stakeholders. So we have rights holders and libraries and all working on this. And what our proposal is for the reasonable search is reasonable in the context of ac access and equity, means expending the same effort, cost and time to locate materials in accessible formats as would be expended in locating the same work for a user without a print disability. So we're working uh, with a, that coalition of stakeholders to agree on that proposed language. And, um, 
and other other legislative provisions that are there, but that is one of the most uh, difficult to uh, to work out with with all the stakeholders. So the next item that I'm I'm working on is um, is implement another effort to implement on the ground, and it is with um, the Association of Research Libraries, so a U.S.-based association, and the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Uh, so over three years, we've been working on a pilot project to implement the Marrakesh Treaty across borders at our at these research institutions. So we have a, a task force that worked with um, four or five research libraries to document the process of implementing the treaty and the barriers, and then to provide a pathway of practices and documentation for libraries to fulfill the Marrakesh Treaty for, for access. So uh, the task force fortunately had a cadre of experts in systems implementation and metadata and experienced users at every level in the academy. So undergraduates, graduates, PhD candidates. And we talked to we talked to the metadata experts, the systems, ex the systems people, and, um, and those beneficiaries. And the consultations and explorations of the of the capabilities of the systems. So that's the, the, the library management systems, the metadata schemes, all allowed us to test the implementation on the systems that the libraries had. Uh, so we did that at the at the local institution. So sometimes that was that was in the in Canada and the United States. And then we had international uh, efforts to exchange the works international. So what we discovered in that project, uh, what we surfaced were some of the barriers uh, to the treaty. And those are the national, the national legal system. So Canada's implementation and the America, the United States implementation were different. So Canada adopted uh, two op optional provisions um, that limited, that narrowed the exception. So, and that reduced those, that, those exceptions add an administrative and bureaucratic burden on the libraries in Canada. And so that, those, those resources are expended in, in work that doesn't really hmm, produce any, any benefit. If you do a commercial avail availability check, on a market that doesn't produce accessible formats. Mostly you're wasting your time, but we have to do it, it's in the law. So, so we had, so that part, that was a barrier. So not having similar legislative language in countries that wanna do an exchange makes it uh, burdensome. So it's burdensome on the systems, it's burdensome on the people who are providing the service. The metadata also, um, so we have metadata schemes in libraries. We have numerous and all kinds of people in the publication ecosystem have different standards and schema. But even in the, in the library one, we had a number of uh, fields in the, mark, in the mark scheme, for example, that relate to accessibility, but none of us Im implemented them in the same way. So not having a standardized a uh, metadata scheme where we use the um, the fields in the same way is a barrier to uh, access and to the implementation of the treaty. So work is being done on that. We are just at the end of this week, actually. Uh, one of the fields is going forward for uh, one of the steps in the standardization project process. So that's that's a po very positive outcome of this project. And the people who were on the task force are the, some of those people who are well placed on those international uh, bodies that move those uh, that move those standards ahead. And then the systems, how we get the systems. So many uh, in Canada, we have uh, good disability laws where we, when we acquire systems for library. Um, for library for library services, a library management system. Accessibility is a requirement for those systems. So the same difficulty we have with those systems as we have with metadata, we don't all use them in the same way. We, we implement them locally. We make our decisions locally about how we're serving our, 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 our users at home. So having that, um, having those 
standards on how we, we discover and exchange and deliver materials across uh, institutions is something that needs to needs to have some work. And also the, aut the way we automate and approach who our beneficiaries are so that we can have an authentic authentication of those users uh, that happens automatically. So when they log into the system or they're participant in the system, the system recognizes them as having access to those, those collections that are not available um, to, the, to mainstream users. So those are, it's a, we, what we discovered is it's a complex, I know everybody who's put their hand to this knows how complex and involved it is to implement the treaty um, and to, to get the provisions of access uh, into systems. So the recommendations in the future work of, of the project is well, is well documented and will be made available on the CARL and ARL websites at the end of, sometime in July. But some of the things that we think are important to, um, to highlight here is that legislative pitfalls, um, we, we need to avoid them. We need to make sure that if we're looking at uh, the extension of the Marrakesh for other disabilities, we need to ensure that there aren't um, optional restrictions that different people can, can, um, can avail themselves of, that different countries can avail themselves of, because it adds a real impediment to the delivery. And then uh, the metadata standards and the system standards. There are a plethora of, of recommendations that go with them that will be available. So some of them are quite technical. And for those of us who are employed and, and need to have that technical detail, they will be there for them. So to paraphrase two of the metadata experts from them, from them from the task force, implementing Marrakesh is a huge task and one that we've only just begun. And the work ahead can be shared with all of us. And I, I think as I listen to all the people who spoke before me, this is a complimentary. We all have a separate piece of this, trying to solve it. And together, I think we can make um, a, a great um, effort at implementing and providing the access that the treaty promised. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Victoria, for this uh, wonderful in-depth uh, uh, things, bringing the whole uh, implementation uh, complexities and nitty-gritties uh, along and um, the real librarian's perspective on um, how the treaty is being implemented. Um, must mention that uh, uh, Canada was the 20th country to ratify and which meant that uh, you know, it 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 that was a point from where it became possible to, uh, you know, uh, bring the treaty on force with Canada's uh, ratification, and um, also that uh, we will be mo moving right across the globe uh, from Canada to Australia, uh, and I will be inviting people from Vision Australia, uh, Valdana Project, and Shivon Dennis. Uh, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but, um, and this is very significant because this journey uh, from Canada to Australia or Australia to Canada was very significant in terms of Marrakesh Treaty implementation and why so is something that our friends of Asian Australia are going to share with us. Floor is, your, floor is yours, Shivan. And... Hi there. Um... Uh, I'll be very quick, I have to say, because I don't actually have much information <laughs> on the, the exchange that took place about eight years ago. I think I've got maybe two old emails from 2016. Um, so I don't have a lot of information about what happened back then. And I am pretty much the last person standing from the staff who were involved with that at the time. Um, so from uh, what, I, what information I've been able to glean is that um, Australia and Canada uh, ratified um, at about the same time and Australia's uh, new copyright laws came into effect on the 29th of September 2016. And a few days before that, I think on about the 25th or the 26th, the idea was struck to... Um, 
the idea was struck to have a symbolic exchange of a number of titles between CNIB, between Canada and Vision Australia, um, utilising the ABC catalogue. Um, so I was asked as the acquisition, I'm the acquisitions librarian at Vision Australia to select 10 titles that, uh, 10 titles from CNIB, um, and we would organise, and they would select 10 from us, and we would organise to exchange them symbolically on the same day that the laws came into effect. Um, that all went, the selection of titles went very well, um, although uh, what happened was that there were some um, technical issues with the data on the ABC catalogue at the time. And of the 10 that I selected, only three were actually available. Five had been cancelled, two had never existed, <laughs> and one was a commercial job. So there were some issues with the data at the time. And after a few days of back and forth, we ended up settling and managing to get three titles instead of 10. Um, and that uh, was pretty much what happened. So we had some issues with being able to locate content on, on the platform and being able to get them cleared um, in time as well. Um, but everybody pulled together between both Canada um, and ABC and Vision Australia and we managed to get that symbolic exchange to take place just on the line. I think we were, we, we were just... Um, being able to get them downloaded on the day that the the uh, title was ratified, the, that the law was ratified. So unfortunately, I really honestly don't have a lot of information for you. Um, <laughs> that's about it. I can read out the titles that I picked, but that's the only information I've got. <laughs> But if anyone would like to ask any questions, I'm I'm happy to um I'm happy to wing it. Wonderful. No, Shibon, I think this was uh, absolutely momentous. It was absolutely wonderful. It was uh, symbolic, it, not just symbolic, but it just, you know, meant that almost like cutting of the ribbon and, you know, opening of the doors of international exchange and announcing to the world that, yes, now it is possible. So it was a huge moment for all of us. And uh, the role that uh, Vision Australia and CNIB played and ABC played in all this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, it was, it, we yeah. had a bit of a rough start technically, but things work so much better. Like, I think what's one, what's nice to look at looking back um, at this, this symbolic exchange now of uh, how complicated and clunky it was. And now things yeah. run so much smoothly and, um, you know, that, that process now has been refined beautifully um, and works really well, which I think is, is like testament to all the hard work that so many people have done around the world. Thank you. So um, I think from there, let's, let's move on to another um, uh, country. Let's go to Once Spain and uh, Francisco Mart Martinez. Um, and uh, Spanish language, of course, is shared among so many countries between Spain and whole of the uh, lot of countries in Latin America. And this treaty actually meant a lot for this group of countries. So um, uh, uh, Francisco, floor is, floor is yours for uh, your perspective, please. Thank you, Dependra. Thank you, any uh, flattening to everyone for inviting us to uh, to this wonderful occasion. We are celebrating the 10th anniversary of what's been considered the first WIPO human rights treaty, so happy birthday, everyone. However, in practical terms, I, I have to say that EU members, European Union members, for us, the treaty is at best for around four years. So uh, after its entry into force on the first day of uh, 2019, uh, also the national organization of Spanish blind persons, we couldn't start making an effective use of the treaty until October that year, October 2019. Uh, what, have we, what have we done since then? Uh, we decided to start by expanding what we already have, by sharing with users in, in other countries what our users had already been enjoying for a few years in Spain, under our, our control and restricted access to our own digital library, which contains all our dainty books, right? Indoors, including a few thousands of great music works. All we had to do 
actually was to treat our colleague institutions based on a Marrakesh compliant country as one more of our users. That was the simplest and most straightforward way of doing it. And that allowed us to start sharing our collection with users in other Spanish speaking countries without further delay. After that, Arthur got greedy as well and decided that we also wanted to grab some books from our users. So ABC at that point became the best option available to make that happen. And it not only expanded our library with immediate access to the collections of dozens of fellow institutions and to the thousands of titles they, they hold, but it also allowed, allowed us to reach and provide our services to those libraries that were already members of ABC and but had no direct access to our digital. So I'll give you some figures as well. Uh, our digital library holds nearly 39,000 daisy titles. I beat over 31,000 Braille titles and 3,600, 600 Braille music titles. Any authorized entity with direct access to our online library can download any of these files. However, ABC members only have access to our Daisy and Braille music files so far. That's our Braille collection is still, it's right in the process of being uploaded to the ABC for Braille. So since October 2019, Alfa has distributed nearly 3,000 titles to 26 authorized entities in 17 countries. A small percentage of, uh, has gone to some institutions in Europe. Most of those titles have traveled in other countries in America, North and South. Amazingly, or maybe not so anymore, our best client is the NLS at the Library of Congress in Washington. The downloads among the two or nearly half of those 3,000 titles. Argentina, with both the Floribros and the Argentinian Library line, is by far our best customer among the rest of uh, Latin American countries. The request amount to 30% of all the books we searched so far. Outside Europe and America, I like to point out that 10% of our book requests have traveled as far as Australia. I hope she, she won't explain us why. <laughs> that's, that's really amazing. Our book collection has grown in 415 titles from 17 countries since we joined ABC. This means that our previous collection of around 120 titles in foreign languages is now three and a half years later, uh, 4.5 times bigger. These figures, however, are, to me, they, they, they are misleading. Uh, quantifying the success of the treaty using these figures may give the impression that the treaty is being underused. I have always said that this treaty is not about copying and pasting entire collections from other organizations into our own castles to just to make them grow. It's not about how many books you have. It's, it's, it's about how many books you can get, you can have. Access is the key word uh, in the Marrakesh Treaty. Just by having access, for instance, to the ABC platform on this book collection has gone from 74,000 titles to nearly 800,000. These are the figures that we, we should use to measure the success of the treaty. So in Latin America, uh, we also have other uses. We have Mexico in North America and for the South, we also receive requests mainly from Colombia, Peru, and Uruguay. I, I know of the difficulties that some of our users in Latin America are having with our daisy books. Uh, these books were produced using a small production mechanism devised by the daisy consortium that scrambled the order of the MP3 files in the book as a sort of uh, soft DRM solution. Many of our potential users in other countries do not have access to basic compliant device. They, they use MP3 players that can play the files of a basic book, but not in the right reading order. So Arthur stopped creating books like that using that IP protection mechanism around a year ago, and we are now trying to devise a solution to bulk convert the rest of our collection into plain MP3 books. The Daisy Consortium has included in the latest version of pipeline uh, a simple tool for users to scramble these books uh, and it, though it works just one book at a time so for us as producers it's not still the solution we're looking for but for users it's, it's, it's okay 
So yesterday I was asked a, in, an, in an interview if I thought that the treaty was working. I thought that if I could evaluate it, it's given the expected results. And yes, I, I do believe it's working. The, the concept is working fine. Um, just to give you an example, and I don't want to compare uh, the Marrakesh treaty with, with, with the, the, the Braille system. In France, the, the Braille system needed 25 years to be accepted, to be adopted, and to be used by, by, by everyone. And for the rest of Europe, it took 15 years. So things take time. And, and the Marrakesh Treaty, or any international treaty for that matter, is not a 25-year thing, not even a 15-year thing. The Marrakesh Treaty is here to stay. And, and seeing it working uh, at its full potential will take time. This treaty is a milestone in, in the history of the access uh, to information for all private issues and papers. So it's like the, the treaty would have never been possible without uh, yet a much bigger milestone, like the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, ABC, a service uh, device for customers, not rights holders, hosted and promoted by WIPO, would have never existed without this treaty. The fact that ebooks are one of the products included in the so called European Accessibility Act shows the kind of precedent set by the Marrakesh Treaty. Because the paradigm shift that it has brought to us, to, to the world of intellectual property and to the society in general, is already very. Uh, and we may not be the ones to enjoy those fruits in full, but in time, others, others may. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Francisco. That was so intriguing. I think this was uh, such a wonderful examples that you have brought in forward and, um, and, and putting things in the right uh, perspective, absolutely, on the implementation, where we are and where we are heading to. Uh, with that, uh, let's have uh, Barbara Martin, again from ONSE, but in her capacity as the Vice President of the European Blind Union with her perspectives on the Marrakesh Treaty. Barbara. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank IFLA and Darcy Consortium for taking the opportunity to celebrate online, not only among us, but others who are listening and watching us, this 10th anniversary of the Marrakesh Treaty. And I have to say it, this is a very important day. It was a milestone. It was the miracle of Marrakesh Treaty, and it was, and indeed it made come true our dream. Uh, I know time flies and it was said before that 10 years can seem uh, long enough and short enough, but the thing is that uh, the Marrakesh Treaty is here and it remains more than ever. Why I'm saying this? Well, because back then in 2013, our claim was that uh, more than 253 million people, according to WBU, the World Blind Union, uh, were hungry uh, of reading and learning uh, using accessible formats. Well, we are in 2023 and this is the case. We are still hungry, but fortunately we have the Marrakesh Treaty that is one of those important and essential tools that will help to reduce it. So it is, you know, I just adore the Marrakesh Treaty. From the European Blind Union <clears throat> that represents 30 million blind and partially sighted people, uh, the Marrakesh Treaty was, is, and will keep on being one of our priorities, as it is Braille. And indeed, both of them are related because both of them gave blind and partially sighted people the opportunity to access to information, to education, to culture, and finally, to employment. One was in the 19th century, the other one was in the 20th, first, 21st century. No matter what, they are linked and they are here to stay. Uh, in the European Blind Union, once the treaty was adopted uh, in 2013, we had to start working almost from a scratch at European, EU, e, e, European Union level. Why? Because, well, we, we had to adopt our legislation uh, to the Marrakesh Treaty. So the European Union, as you know, 27 countries, 
everything is slow, everything requires time. And it took us another five years to get the legislation uh, on board, a directive and a regulation. And uh, finally, we managed to get it. And um, finally, we demonstrated that, of course, blind and partially sighted people are, um, you know, we can, we can fight and we can get what we want when we are so sure that what we need and we, we, we are asking for is absolutely legitimized. Um, up to now, uh, I think it was Monica who said it, uh, there are, including the different uh, EU countries, 119 uh, countries that has ratif have ratified the Marrakesh Treaty. Well, um, I have to say that 37 of them are from the European Blind Union, one of the regions of the World Blind Union. And one of them is Ukraine. I want to highlight this because they their accession has been um, uh, done during this year. I think it was in March. And this gives you an idea how important can be this treaty for blind and partially sighted people, even when they are in a very, very rough situation. So this is again, like we claim in 2013, uh, it's about our needs that are real. Uh, well, from EBU uh, as a regional uh, organization, as you can and you, as you can imagine, is complicated uh, trying to figure it out how uh, all the implementation of the Marrakesh Treaty is at national level. So we have to deal at a more transversal way. So we are now in the process of uh, evaluating uh, the directive I mentioned before. Uh, after five years, and the European Commission uh, has sent, uh, will develop a consultation where I encourage people to, to participate on that, uh, to see if the directive is working. Because uh, as Paco Francisco said, uh, it is uh, working the Marrakesh Treaty, there are some uh, problems and it's always a way to improve it. Uh, it is true that in 2025, due to the European Accessibility Act uh, in Europe, we'll be happy and um, finally we will manage to get ebooks. Uh, this means devices and ebooks as files in uh, accessible format. But uh, I'm afraid that is, this is not enough. And this does not mean that the Marrakesh Treaty will die not until <laughs> we get what we are looking for, which is uh, uh, the possibility to buy the book at the same time, same price as the others. But anyway, I insist on this. Uh, the European Accessibility Act won't make Marrakesh Treaty die because what they are doing with the European Accessibility Act only refers to part of some format, kind of format. We still need books in accessible format, in braille, in audio, and of course, all books behind 2025, which for this, the Marrakesh Treaty is alive forever and ever. Well, as a user, uh, if, I don't know, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Spanish, so I my, 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 tongue, mother tongue is Spanish. I speak English and I speak Italian as well. So, um, and I belong to ONCE. So I am very lucky to have a very good and big and uh, with a good quality uh, library. Uh, thanks that I am a good reader and I study a lot. So for me, after 2019, when ONCE uh, had the Marrakesh Treaty implemented and on board, I managed to read in Italian, in native Italian. Oh my God, I couldn't believe that, you know? It, it was just that, 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 okay, yes, 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 yes. I want more of those. So we're getting there. Um, I can tell you that uh, the most English uh, book uh, in the Onthe library is one from Agatha Christie. So this shows what I was telling you before, that we want and we need to read books that are quite old, but obviously we are <laughs> uh, curious enough and we are engaged to culture. So no matter what age the book has, we want to read it as well. So, well, what can I say? For those who know me, I, I think many of you, or many of you do so far, you know, I'm passionate. I was delighted to share 
with um, uh, Scott Barrett and of course with Marion Diamond, with Francisco and so many others. Uh, the momentum we felt in Marrakesh 10 years um, back in time. So let me just say one sentence in English and Spanish that will resume how I feel about it. Long life to Marrakesh Treaty. Viva el Tratado de Marrakesh. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. And yes, all of us who are watching that number grow of people of the countries who were, you know, ratifying. And what a day it was when the number really shot up as soon as European Union actually put in their papers for the, the ratification. Uh, what a jubilation it was for us and wonderful. And uh, so now let's move on to a different continent and a different language group and also uh, invite uh, on, you know, here, uh, Yasmin Yusuf, who is the chair of the section, uh, library section serving persons with brain disabilities, the hostess, the host, the real host of this event, uh, co-host with us, Yasmin, floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandra, very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to ICLA and uh, DAISY Consortium uh, for uh, this event. Um, today, I will be talking about uh, the progress or the status of uh, Marrakesh Treaty, but um, in the Arabic uh, speaking uh, countries, with a little bit of focus on my country, Egypt, uh, as an example of a country that, although has not ratified, is still on the road to Marrakesh, but we have done some efforts um, uh, through the past years um, to try to achieve or to disseminate uh, accessible publications to our users. So let me just give you some background information on um, uh, on the Arabic speaking countries. Uh, there are 22 Arabic speaking countries with over 400 million speakers. So it's a, it's a very big uh, language group. Um, the the ebook market is 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 quite new um, and is growing in in our region with three countries leading that um, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and Egypt. And when it comes to the Marrakesh Treaty, uh, out of those twenty two countries, only six Arab countries have ratified. These are uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Morocco, Qatar, and Tunisia. Um, I would have loved to say that Egypt is, is one of those countries, but we are still uh, on our way there, and hopefully soon we will be able to do that. Um, speaking about those countries that have ratified so far in our region, they also are still, although they have ratified, but they are still in uh, progress of, uh, of reforming their copyright law and, and getting uh, uh, their exception and implementing the treaty. So, um, so far, Jordan still has not uh, incorporated that into its national law. Uh, Qatar is still in process. Morocco is working uh, on a draft law that would amend this. Um, and UAE is maybe the only country that has actually um, uh, reformed their copyright uh, law. And um, they're still not clear what's happening, whether in Saudi Arabia or um, Tunisia. Uh, moving on to another example uh, from the Arab countries, which is Egypt, um, that has not ratified yet, but is still working uh, on, uh, on ratification and implementation. To give you a background, um, our country has a population of over 100 million, with uh, around 13.3% of the population uh, are persons with uh, print disabilities, and 43% of uh, persons with disabilities uh, are uh, aged between 30 and 64 years. Uh, we also have uh, literacy rates of 25.8% uh, uh, illiteracy, and 56% uh, of persons with disabilities are illiterate, versus 5.6% uh, who have a university degree. Um, so in 2017, we started our efforts to um, to change the situation. Uh, we had so many challenges and barriers. The first barrier, of course, was the legal barriers that we don't have any copyright exceptions in our copyright law, in our national copyright law. Uh, when it comes to the technology, there was not enough support for the Arabic language, whether it comes to uh, authoring tools that produce accessible uh, publications or even the reading systems. 
Uh, when it comes to libraries, we only had one library, which is the Library of Alexandria that has had, that has had so far a great role into um, uh, changing this. Uh, only one library offering accessible publication. And in this context, the demand was increasing, especially in the educational sector. Um, and at that time, there was no awareness uh, or benefits of, um, of the benefits of the treaty and what it can offer. Uh, and thanks to the EFLA LPD um, uh, that took the initiative and started the, um, the ball running, as we say in our country, uh, EFLA LPD organized the symposium in 2017 uh, in collaboration with the World Blind Union, as well as the Library of Alexandria. And we invited key government officials to take part and uh, to have a conversation. Uh, and, um, and by the end of the symposium, we were able to have a statement issued by those participants to um, uh, to encourage the government to ratify. And this event, although it has not uh, achieved what we were hoping for, but it was still a very important stepping stone for more initiatives and advocacy activities that we have been doing for five years now. A year afterwards, in 2018, um, the government um, issued a new disability law that um, had better uh, provisions for the rights of persons with disabilities in general, and particularly had articles on equal access to education, as well as access to culture. And we saw this as a very good step, a huge step for persons with disabilities, and a good basis for the implementation, for the ratification and implementation of the treaty. Uh, following that, we started a, a couple of projects uh, in our country uh, to advocate also for implementation. Uh, we had uh, the, the Egyptian government had two projects with the Japanese uh, government. The first one was to disseminate accessible Arabic publications. Uh, and through this project, we were able to develop uh, an authoring tool that uh, uh, works well with Arabic, supports Arabic and uh, followed by many uh, awareness uh, seminars and activities to advocate for uh, access to information and the treaty. Um, and then from 2019 to 22, we started a longer project working on capacity building uh, of uh, librarians and professionals on uh, accessible publishing. And also that included a lot of advocacy events and workshops to promote uh, for the treaty. Um, also, in addition to that, we did a lot of awareness reading workshops, and we still do, to promote accessible reading. Um, and among the target groups were persons with visual impairment, uh, learning disabilities, and we were really impressed by the impact that those awareness raising workshops had on uh, young children with uh, learning disabilities who felt that for the first time they were able to, to read and enjoy uh, reading. Um, so comparing those uh, those two years, 2017 and today, 2023, after five years, um, a lot has been done. Many institutions now promote the treaty. Uh, two, we have two libraries who support and offer library services for persons with disabilities, the Library of Alexandria and our National Library. And the National Library actually is, is playing a huge role into advocating for the treaty and uh, whether on a governmental level or um, uh, on a community level. More authoring tools and reading systems are now supporting the Arabic language and supporting the reading of uh, Arabic accessible content. Uh, more professionals now are, tra are trained. We have over 42 professionals trained to, uh, on accessible publishing. And now we have a, a disability law that actually supports uh, the work of, uh, of the treaty and what it can do once ratified. Um, so to conclude my talk, although we have not yet ratified uh, in Egypt, but uh, we, we, we have done a lot to, um, to work towards uh, the, the treaty. Uh, so we have seen some progress. We still have some challenges, of course. Uh, and a lot of advocacy efforts, initiatives, and projects have contributed to increase the awareness and the production of accessible publications. And I think that only through collaboration between all the stakeholders, whether governments and organizations um, and the, the community, uh, we are able to ensure the realization of uh, the treaty. I'm so happy that now that after five years, no one was aware of what Marrakesh can do to people. And now Marrakesh Treaty is, is always a topic on our table when we discuss the rights of persons with disability. So happy um, anniversary uh, to all of us. Um, happy Marrakesh Treaty. And thank you, everyone. Over to you, Dependra. 
Thank you so much, uh, Yasmin. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you for uh, your leadership and being the chair of this IFLA uh, LPD section uh, and providing all that guidance and leadership to the group. Um, uh, from there, uh, I would now like to uh, invite another member of the IFLA LPD section, uh, Jiat uh, Rubens. That's how my screen reader is saying your name. I hope it is correct pronunciation. You can please just say a line of introduction of yourself so that everybody knows what how your name is really pronounced. Uh, floor is yours, Jiat. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Participating at the conference in Marrakesh was one of the highlights in my career. Now I'm a retired director of the Flemish Library for Braille and Audiobooks in Belgium. I was there, and I, but still now I'm feeling the excitement of obtaining an agreement. Uh, it was really the miracle of Marrakesh has already set some people. Uh, um, I was there, the one and only uh, LPD member of the standing committee. I took the place from uh, Kun Krikar, the former chair of uh, LPD at that time. Uh, in my uh, remembrance, the conference took place in a beautiful conference center in a very, in a very modern neighborhood of Marrakesh near to the desert. Uh, there was also a, a huge meeting room with place for almost 1,000 people. It is, was very impressive. And there were also some small rooms for private discussions of the different groups of lobbyists, the right holders, delegates of 130 member states of the United Nations, and also the beneficiaries and interest groups. Um, I think we have to really get in mind that the agreement, the Marrakesh Treaty, is the result of the negotiations between those three parties. I think it's important to, uh, uh, to focus on this, that this is the right holders, the governments, and uh, the beneficiaries as get an agreement. Um, and I also had the impression um, that the chair of the conference I think it was the, the Moroccan Minister of, Cult of Culture has played a very big role in the success of the conference. I think he wants to really get uh, an agreement um, within on, on African ground, I should say so. Um, also, I think in, in my, my mind, um, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary. We have to also to take in account that it took almost 10 years of lobby work before 2013, before the, the agreement has been uh, uh, come to stand. Um, and I think there has been a lot of good job done by lobbying from WU, DBU, WIPO and other NGOs to obtain that result. Um, on the 27th of June in 2013, I had the honor to give, in name of LPD, a closing statement to express the gratitude of the international library community for all the hard work carried out by those three parties, and also to focus on the importance of this treaty for all persons with print disabilities. Um, unfortunately, I had not the, I had to catch my flight back to Brussels the 28th of June, so I missed the concert of Stevie Wonder. So I think <laughs> it, it was, I still remember that. Uh, also, I have to uh, express that I, me I met a lot of nice people from those different NGOs, uh, WIPO, WEU, EBU, and IFLA, and so on. Too much to name them all, but I think they have done a really big job and I want to thank them for the result obtained in 2013. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jair, for taking us down that memory lane of such a wonderful event there. Um, I'm aware that we are um, uh, past 90 minutes, but now comes the 
uh, last but not the least uh, presentation uh, by uh, Teresa Hackett, who uh, comes from the uh, network of organizations, I would say rather, which is the electronic information for uh, libraries. So Teresa, please, floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve Pendra, and thanks to everyone for your uh, wonderful presentations. It really, uh, it really shows the breadth and the depth of the work that's happening. So my name is Teresa Hackett. I am Copyright and Libraries Program Manager at Eiffel that works with libraries in developing and transition economy countries in Europe, Africa, and Asia. And we participated in the Marrakesh negotiations from the start in Geneva to the finish in Marrakesh. So we experienced the highs and the lows that we've heard about, the breakthroughs and the blockages, the tedium, because to be honest, sometimes the negotiations were, you know, very long and, and working late into the night. And we also experienced the joy, the sheer joy, when agreement was finally reached in, in Marrakesh. And I'm sorry, Gert, that you missed the Stevie Wonder concert, because um, when he made good on his promise to come back to Marrakesh, if there was an agreement, I've been reliably informed that it was the only time that there was dancing in the aisles at a WIPO diplomatic conference. So it was a privilege and an honor for me to participate and to work with all the great partners on the treaty, because we all knew that the Marrakesh Treaty had the potential to transform people's lives. And from early on, Eiffel and IFLA recognized that we as librarians had an important stake in the negotiations. We knew that libraries had a key role in delivering on any treaty text that was agreed. So the outcomes really mattered. And not only was there a treaty, there was a good treaty at the end of it. So when the treaty was adopted at WIPO, it wasn't the end. It was the beginning of a new phase, ratification, implementation, and take up by, by libraries. And we, as IFL, are proud to have supported advocacy in 36 countries that have ratified the treaty. That's about one fifth of the total ratifications. And um, to support the advocacy, we produced a number of resources. So we produced the first library guide for libraries, um, which is a general guide setting out the basic principles of the treaty. And then later on, as countries had ratified the treaty, we collaborated with IFLA on the Getting Started Guide uh, that Victoria talked about earlier. And this guide is now available in multiple languages in English, French, uh, Russian, Serbian, Spanish, Lithuanian, Nepali, Arabic, Spanish, Portuguese, and so on. It's available online. It can, it's under Creative Commons license. It can be translated and adapted. And now, as countries are domesticating the treaty, we have been uh, working with countries to adapt the Universal Getting Started Guide for national law. So, for example, um, we recently launched the Kenyan edition of the guide in Nairobi on World IP Day, together with the Kenyan Copyright Office and the Kenyan Library Consortium, that's Eiffel's partner in Kenya. Um, so. So I was asked to give a kind of a roundup of the successes and the challenges. Um, uh, I, I think we've heard many examples of, of the successes. And I think what we can see are that in many countries, um, librarians, speaking from the library perspective, are learning about their new rights and responsibilities under the treaty. They are doing surveys to identify user needs, agreeing on these very important metadata standards for increased discoverability in global catalogs. They're creating federated catalogs. They're doing quality checks on the resources to make sure that the readers have the best reading experience. And they're developing accessible digital library systems and upskilling their staff in using these new uh, resources and technologies. And I think what's striking is the variety of initiatives. So, there's no right or wrong approach. Every initiative is contributing to a sustainable global network. And some of these book exchanges are operating on an informal basis between libraries in response to individual requests. 
for example, between uh, uh, libraries in Lithuania and in Poland. Some initiatives focus on serving, re serving common language needs, like we heard from ONSE, for example, and others are global in ambition, like the ABC catalog. And you can read more about these and some other examples from Austria, India, Canada, Kyrgyzstan, and Japan in a, uh, the chapter on the Marrakesh Treaty that's available in the IFLA book, uh, Navigating Copyright for Library. So I co-wrote that chapter together with uh, Eustace Drayling. And I'll just give one very recent example of um, how multilateral cooperation enabled by the treaty has had an impact. And that's where over 420 accessible books in Ukrainian have recently become available through libraries, thanks to uh, efforts in Ukraine, in Lithuania, in the United States, and through the ABC uh, service. So now libraries in Europe in particular can start to use these accessible collections for refugees from Ukraine with print disabilities who are fleeing the war. Now, Ukraine is the latest country to join Marrakesh. So it's country 119 on, on Monica's slides at the beginning of this session. And this is great because it will smooth that legal process, especially for the cross-border exchanges. What's more is that Ukraine has also implemented the treaty into national law. And, and, and that brings me on to the, the, the challenges. So we heard from a number of previous speakers that implementation is a challenge. That less than half of the countries that have joined the Marrakesh Treaty had incorporated the treaty's provisions into their national law. So this needs to improve. We need to work you know, hard at that to, 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 to go that extra step. But you know, I think it's important to acknowledge and to appreciate all the countries that have implemented the treaty because it is a great achievement. And I believe that um, Nigeria is probably the most recent country to have implemented Marrakesh into its national law as part of a, a wider copyright law reform. So, you know, we, we, we thank Nigeria for that and we hope that Nigeria can then lead the way in Africa in encouraging other countries in Africa that have ratified but have yet to implement. And in this context, I had two suggestions for what might help. Um, so we know that in some countries, well, in some countries around the world, but in particular, in some countries that have ratified the treaty, international treaties are self-executed. So this means that they don't require uh, specific or separate legislative implementation in order for the treaty to apply. So I think we could, we could, highlight those countries where that is the case and raise awareness of this so that the, the, the blind communities and the libraries in those countries uh, you, you know, are aware that they can actually start to use the treaty. The second um, suggestion would be that um, we could use the judgment of the Constitutional Court in South Africa where, as some of you might know, uh, blind South Africa uh, uh, brought a legal challenge and won that legal challenge to enforce their rights under the Marrakesh Treaty. And the court's judgment is quite interesting. It takes a strong human rights approach. So it could be a useful precedent for advocates who are advocating in other countries who may be facing similar delays. So using some of those arguments from the court to help, uh, you know, to help advocate to the government. Then the second challenge is, again, as we've heard from before, is that you know, accessible books don't fall from trees, as Martin Keaty said recently in Nairobi. Um, so as these legal barriers are lifted, we have to work and work hard to make sure it happens. And it is a work in progress. And you're all testament to that wonderful work that's going on. And I think that the special libraries serving people with print disabilities, so members of the IFLA section, um, LPD section, have a leadership role to play in promoting the treaty to libraries in your country. And that's libraries of all types, academic libraries and public libraries, um, to create partnerships with those libraries, to provide training on the accessible resources to those libraries. Um, so, so I think you know that could be an that could that's an important yeah an important role. 
Well, you know, especially after this almost well, more than hour and a half, after having heard all of the initiatives, I'm really heartened by the commitment and the dedication of everyone who's taking this forward uh, and continuing to take this forward. I think the future is bright. And the Marrakesh Treaty was about people, not profit. And it's people that will and are making this happen. So here's to the next 10 years. Thank you, Dependra, over to you. Very, very, very well said, Teresa. I think it's a, it's a big hope and uh, uh, the, the past 10 years have been wonderful, but I'm sure the next 10, uh, 10 years, I mean, past, uh, are going to be much, much better than the even, even better than the past 10 years, looking at the passion, looking at the commitments uh, that we all had in this room um, for this. Uh, so with that, we are uh, coming to the end of this webinar. But before we go, I think, I, I mean, I would like to thank uh, especially Christian from Leipzig, Germany, who helped from the IPLA LPD section to bring, to put all of this webinar together. Christian, you will have a last word for, for, for all the participants, um, thanking all the participants and the panelists who have been wonderfully here. Christian? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dipendra. So I, all I can say is thank you to everyone for your patience, for your um, being here for a long time. But I think at a good party, you are staying for a long time as well. You have a good dance at the end. And maybe this is what we have just done, um, um, partying the whole night, <laughs> even though it's daytime at some other places. So thank you and congratulations to everyone. Hope to see you soon. And of course, we want to send all of you um, where the um, video will be. And of course, all the little links and web pages and that you have all the information we can give you. Thank you. Wonderful. And if we were together, I'm sure we would have been popping champagne cock open and all that. So lots of celebration to everybody. Thank you so much for joining this celebration with us to make this day absolutely a wonderful day for all of us. Thank you.